Greetings, everyone. It's great to have you watching us. I have some news that may not be pleasing for some of you. Uh, I received a call from our DS a little while ago asking questions of how things were going and where exactly we lived. After answering his questions, he told me that he wanted to reassign me. Now, I explained to the DS that it has been such a short time and that I wasn't really ready to move. And he reminded me that we work on an itinerant system, um, basically saying I didn't have a choice. Well, I got a call on February 26th to go meet with this prospective congregation. Friday, I got a call from uh, Reverend Ed Proud saying that he will be meeting with the PPR-SPRC Committee of Middle Ridge to update the church profile, to start the process of finding someone to take over. I'm sorry for telling you in this manner, but it's all happened so fast that my head is reeling also. I know this is not something we were looking for, it's not something that I asked for, um, but it is happening. But let's try to set that all aside now and let's take a moment to let it go and quietly to prepare our hearts and our minds for this worship. Please join me in our call to worship. You will read the response as it appears on the screen. Let the redeemed of the Lord offer praise. 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 We praise you, O God, for loving us and claiming us as your own. Amen. And now join me in reading our opening prayer. Gracious God, so often we've missed your presence because we're looking for you clothed in a particular way. Let this time of worship be an encounter with you that will enable us to behold you in all the people we meet and all the situations we greet. You are from everlasting to everlasting, so we are confident that you are here. Help us to be aware of your holy presence. O oh Lord, enrich this act of worship with the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but Thou art mighty. Hold me with Thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. May the Lord be with you. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. That I may love what Thou dost love. And do what Thou wouldst do. 
So I know the news of us leaving is not pleasant news. It's actually kind of depressing, even for Ram and I. And it comes at the end of a pretty good week, especially if we're talking about the weather. Uh, this winter has dragged on top with the virus keeping us apart and has caused many people to fall into a depressed state of mind. You know, this is nothing new. Even Martin Luther experienced depression from time to time. He once was so depressed over a prolonged period that one day his wife came downstairs wearing all black. And Martin Luther said, who died? She said, God has. And he said, God hasn't died. And she said, well, live like it and act like it. There's a lot to be said in that statement. And yes, we may be disappointed with the cabinet's decision to move us, but we need to look toward what blessings God has in store for you and for us. It's all God's timing anyway, right? Now, I'm sure God wouldn't plan anything detrimental for this church of faithful believers. God loves you. It says so right in the book of John. As a matter of fact, why don't you get your Bible and let's open them to the third chapter of the book of John and let's read it. Let's read John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now Jesus was sent. He Jesus wasn't sent to condemn us, but to save us. So believing there's something greater in store for us is biblical. But I want you to look back a few verses. Look at verses 14 and 15. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now this is another occasion of Jesus predicting his death and the doorway that it opened for all of us. And by another occasion, we don't mean how repetitive, but instead we mean we need to pay attention here. This is important. But where does it come from? What was John talking about lifting up a snake? And that brings us to today's scripture, which is Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. So turn to that scripture. Turn to Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. And you can follow along as I read. Numbers 21, 4 to 9. So Israel's been, been traveling through the desert for a long time. Um, Moses' brother Aaron has just died. Uh, they were attacked by King Aaron. They vowed their loyalty to God and gave them and, he, and God gave them the victory over the Canaanite king. And now we pick up at verse 4 of chapter 21. Verse 4. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses, and they said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Now keep in mind, they just made a deal with God. Lord, if you save us, we promise to obey you. Now how many times have we made a deal like this? Lord, if you do this, I'll do that. I know I've had many of them. And when things start to go well, or you get what you asked for, we conveniently forget about our part of that bargain. Or at least I do, anyway. Okay, uh, moving on, verse 6. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. 
They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and they said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Gracious God, we ask a blessing upon the reading of your word. Holy Spirit, we invite you to be with and amongst us. I thank you for all those that are watching this video. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would be with all of them and myself and soften our hearts and our minds and open our ears and our eyes to receive what you have for us to receive today. Point out these areas that we need to pay attention to. Amen. So John has Jesus reference this story from Numbers as a way of explaining what he, Jesus, was there to do. It's the first reference to being lifted up and goes back to a story with snakes and poison and grumbling people. But what could be so uplifting about a story of a snake on a stick? That question sounds like a question that Nicodemus would ask. Well, we need to consider why Jesus made the reference to the snake in the desert and give, and, and give perhaps the most famous verse in the whole New Testament, the one that we started with, John 3.16. I mean, how did we get here? Well, it started with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a leader of the people of God. He was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the governing body of the Jews in Israel at Jesus' time. He comes at night, maybe because serious study takes place at night, or maybe because he was afraid of being seen associating with this questionable rabbi from the backwoods. He comes with social niceties, a bit of flattery to grease the wheels of conversation. But Jesus immediately changes the subject. Jesus immediately puts him on the defensive. You have to be a different person to be a part of what God has in store. What? Nicodemus is reeling almost immediately. Knocked off his feet, he spends the rest of the conversation trying to catch up. He makes a feeble joke about climbing back into his mother's womb, hoping to disarm the intensity of the teacher. Because being a different person was sandwiched in the middle of a metaphor about birth. Born again, he said, born from above. Now the word in Greek means both things, a reference to time and to direction. Uh, born again as if the f first time wasn't traumatic enough, uh, again as if the first time wasn't as full of potential as it needed to be, again as if drawing breath like never before, filling your lungs with more than air, breathing in spirit instead. In addition, Spirit from above, as if you were too focused on this life, the one lived out in front of your eyes, and anything invisible isn't real. Anything invisible like love and hope and joy and transformation and possibility isn't what life was about when born from below. It's not a bad life, just a shallow one. Just a nose to the grindstone and fill your meaning in success and failures each and every day and not in the love of a creator who stands ready to fill you with vision. Let go, Nicodemus. Let go of the need to control. Let go of your need to have everything your way. Let go of the belief that you can build a better world, a more vibrant community by shaping it along the lines of your own preferences and understandings. Grab hold of the Spirit and be blown about from one world to the next, from one joy to the next, from one soul to the next. Be born into a new way of singing. Let go of what was, no matter how satisfying it may have been. Grab hold of where God is calling you to go, who God is calling you to be. 
sometimes we can be this Nicodemus. We try to hold on to what we're comfortable with instead of letting go. Letting and letting God take us where we can flourish the best. We try to stay where it's safe instead of letting God move us to where we need to be. Now, I'm not telling you anything new, Nicodemus, Jesus might say. I've been saying these things since I got here, since the beginning of time. This is all I have to say. This is all I know, this God thing, this vision of the people of God, the community of faith. I haven't stopped saying this, and you're a leader of people and somehow don't get it. How can this be, Nicodemus? What did you miss? Get ready. It's about to get even more intense. Now, Jesus gave Nicodemus a whole lot of stuff to think about. And we don't know how it all affected him or what he went away with that night. But a few chapters later, when the rest of the leadership is complaining that the, pol that the police didn't arrest Jesus for speaking of the kingdom of God, Nicodemus speaks up and says, don't we have due process? Now, this isn't an affirmation of faith by any means, but at least he attempts to stand on the side of right. They sneered at him and accused him of being a hick from the, the sticks like Jesus. And then Nicodemus shrinks from sight completely. Well, not completely. He doesn't speak again. But he shows up in the darkness again, the afternoon darkness of a weeping world, and gathers up the body from a horrible death and wraps it up with a, about a hundred pounds of spices and puts it in the tomb of another Pharisee named Joseph. A hundred pounds of spices? Was that really necessary? Maybe. Or maybe it was overkill, overboard. Maybe it was apology spice. Maybe he finally understood what he'd missed that night in the darkness and wanted to make up for it by bringing so much that he could barely carry it. A, a penance of spice poured out over a dead body that wasn't going to stay dead, though he didn't know that yet. Because, and we get back where we need to be, Nicodemus finally had the courage or the faith or the desperation to look up and live. The story from Numbers, is a, isn't, it's not about a snake, and it's, it's not about worshiping an odd sort of idol. It's about acknowledging that you need help. You need a Savior. And it's about obedience to the one who will rescue you from what's killing you if you just look up and live. It isn't a difficult thing to look up at a snake on a stick or a man dying on a cross. And yet it's the hardest thing we could ever do as independent thinking human beings. It's about surrendering ourselves to that which will save us rather than thinking we can do it ourselves if we just plug away at it long enough. It's admitting that there's poison in our system that'll kill us if we don't do something radical, something desperate. It's hard to imagine the squeamishness of the Hebrew people to have a bronze snake on a pole in the midst of the camp while they were, they were surrounded by snakes nipping at their heels. And we could be sure that their prayer was that God would move the snakes out of the way and give them a clear path on their journey. But God chose a different way. God left the snakes around them. Yet God gave them a remedy, a solution to the danger that surrounded them. And all they needed to do was to look up and live. Now God gave us a remedy also. He gave us a son. He gave us his son. Through Jesus we are forgiven. Forgiven by God. Now not long before she died in 1988 in a moment of surprising candor on television, Marganita Lasky, a very well-known secular humanist and novelist, said, what I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. We have that forgiveness because Jesus allowed himself to be hung on the cross. All we have to do is look up, accept that sacrifice, and live. But underneath all of this is a call to commitment. That's what look up and live means. Look up doesn't sound like much of a commitment. But it's a call to move out of ourselves and to allow someone else to take the lead, to take the center of our beings. Look up means see the hope for your own life and the lives of those that you love and indeed the whole world, not in yourself, but in the person of Jesus Christ and his redeeming grace. 
I have no choice at this time but to look up. That's what is making this possible for Rhonda and I. Looking up and knowing that Jesus is with us, with you. And because of that, knowing that God has something special, something better in store for you. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we are thankful for the grace that you offer us daily, even when it seems to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Remind us of your presence and love. Too often, too easily, our eyes are drawn down. God, to the worries and the concerns that we have in our daily lives. We need to see these things and pray, but we also need our eyes to be lifted, God, to the signs of your life among us, to the touch of your healing on our souls, to the cross that casts its liberating shadow across all human affairs. We need our eyes to be lifted, God, so our hearts may be filled with faith and hope and love. Amen. I know this is a time of question and doubt, but look up. Look up and live. Have faith in what God has planned. People made by God, go, go, go. Go thanking and telling others of God's goodness, showing them how to look up and to live. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Until we meet again. Amen.